anyone ever had an experience when you really felt God was close to you? Maybe, maybe you were in a really meaningful, powerful worship service. Perhaps you were at a camp experience or a retreat. Maybe you can go back to your younger years of a particular youth event where you attended, or maybe there was a pivotal time in college when you sensed God's nearness. Maybe you have been through a difficult period, and during that time, God demonstrated His grace and power to you. He met needs that were unexplainable. He answered prayers that seemed to be impossible. And during those periods, you really sensed God's closeness to you. I love what I do for a living. Uh, I get to come out here and see you people uh, from time to time. And this summer, uh, I, well, most summers I spend speaking at a lot of youth camps. I've just come from Charleston, South Carolina, where about 600 teenagers were gathered together. And during the week, God saved 37 new brothers and sisters in Christ. That's right. That's reason to celebrate. And on top of that, there were about 90 other students who heard God speak to them in significant ways and responded with meaningful next steps that they believe that God is calling them to take. 26 of those young men and women sensed that God was calling them into some sort of ministry to be a pastor, a student pastor, a worship leader, a missionary to some part you know, of the world. And so this week, I have really experienced experienced God's closeness as I have watched him working. And a lot of the summer events where I am, I get that experience, but they don't always continue. Several summers ago, I was speaking at a youth event, a youth camp, and similar to this past week, God just worked all week long, not only during the worship services, but young people late, night, late at night in their dorms were knocking on their chaperones' doors and saying, look, I want to become a Christian. I want to begin following Jesus Christ. I mean, it was just all week long, really good things happening. And the Thursday evening service culminated that experience, just a powerful worship service. And so after that worship service dismissed, the church, the, the teenagers went to their church group devotions and processed and debriefed a little bit of what God was doing in their lives, and then they had some free time. And then at that point, you heard the horn on the retreat facility, the camp facility sound, which was the signal, it's time for everyone to go to bed. And so everyone was supposed to go to bed, but they did not. And so I, because I had a very early morning the next day, I went to my room and did try to get to sleep, but I heard <laughs> running on the balconies, giggling, tickle fight, tickle fight. And so I heard all of these things going on, and in the room above me, bam, they were having professional wrestling. I heard ribs crack someone's pancreas, drop down through the ceiling when they were wrestling and knocking around with each other. And so I said, God, please, you know I have to start early. Let these people go to sleep. Give them spiritual Benadryl, Lord. Do what it takes to get them to bed. But there was still all kinds of activities, water balloons, splat, splat against the wall. And this went on into the wee hours of the morning. God, please unleash the four horsemen of the apocalypse. <laughs> These godless pagans don't love you, Lord. Pour out your wrath. Now, hours before, at the conclusion of that service, after, at, after everything that had gone on that week, I felt like one more step and we will be in heaven. But not after that. And sometimes we have those experiences too, don't we? We do have sometimes. We could stop right now and let people just stand up and share. Here was a time when I really sensed God was near to me, but we also have times in which we sense God is very far away. We have times when we're praying, but it seems as if our prayers go right up to the ceiling, bounce, and come back to us. There doesn't appear to be any motion in God's track of moving in our lives. We wonder maybe if he's even aware of what's going on. We do have experiences 
when we find ourselves very close to God, but others when we wonder where he went. Well, does that make us bad Christians? Now, the message today is specifically targeted to people who belong to Jesus Christ. These, these aren't just some general ideas that I'm throwing out. These are specific instructions to those of us who have turned from our sins and received Christ as Savior and now belong to his family, but at some times sense that there's a barrier between God and ourselves. Are we bad Christians? Well, if you've spent much time in God's Word, you know that many of God's faithful, perhaps even some that you've covered this summer together, do have some mountaintop experiences in which they see God's glory rain, God's glory, glory raining down on them. But they also have some very low valley experience. And say, God, are you there? Let's look together at a man named Elijah who had those experiences back to back with each other. If you want to follow along in God's word, you can turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. As you're turning there, let me tell you a little background about Elijah and what we're going to cover today. The region of Tishbe, the village, the town of Tishbe in Israel was not known for its cultural centerness. The people there were considered to be unsophisticated, unpolished, but very tough very rugged individuals, you know, survivalists. And so you didn't want to, to get into a fight with, one, with someone from Tishbe. They rode around with bumper stickers on their camels that said, don't mess with Tishbe. And so you knew to stay away from them. Elijah came from that village and emerged as the primary spokesperson for God during this period in Israel's history. During this period, Ahab was the king. And what the Bible tells us is that up to this point, Ahab was the most wicked king Israel had had. Now, some followed Ahab and, and were even more wicked. But up to this point, Ahab was the most wicked king that Israel had had. He was married to a woman named Jezebel, who was even more evil than Ahab. And so because of the climate that the king and queen created, Israel was in spiritual compromise with God. They didn't want to abandon the Lord completely. And so they continued to gather in the temple and offer their sacrifices. They did not want to turn their backs on God 100% because they were afraid of the consequences. But at the same time, they had become interested and curious about some of the practices of their pagan neighbors around them, their idolatry. And so they began to incorporate some of that into their own spiritual lives. Elijah said, we cannot continue this way. If a God really is God, he deserves 100% of our loyalty, our service, our worship, our devotion. If if." If what we're worshiping really is God, he doesn't, doesn't deserve 50-50 or 80-20 or 90-10 or 99 and 1. Whoever really is God is supreme and deserves all that we can give him. So let's decide who really is God. Elijah said, here's what I propose. Let's have a contest. All of the prophets of Baal, that was the name of the foreign idol, all of the prophets of Baal, you gather together and you build yourself an altar made of wood. Put a sacrifice up on top of that altar. I'm going to do the same. I'm going to build an altar of wood. I'm going to put a sacrifice on top. And whichever God sends fire down out of heaven, we will say, can we just agree that that God is God? And the people said, yes, that is exactly what we will do. And so the prophets of Baal built their altar. They chanted, they prayed, they cried out all day long. Not one spark appeared. After they had exhausted themselves, Elijah then built his altar. He put a sacrifice on top of it. 
He was confident God was about to prove his superiority. And so he asked people to gather 21 barrels of water, seven barrels, three times, pouring it over the top. So now, not only does he have his altar of wood and sacrifice, but the sacrifice and the wood are completely soaked. They are waterlogged, so much so that even the ditch that they had dug around the altar was filled with water. Elijah prayed a very simple prayer. I think, it's, I think I counted correctly 37 words. And God, boom, sent fire down from heaven, burned up the sacrifice, burned up the water-soaked wood, and even dried the water in the ditch so much that when people put their hands in there, they said, this is dust. It's completely dry. And so the people began shouting, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. I picture them putting Elijah up on their shoulders and parading him around. He did it. I picture Elijah. That's right. I did it. And that's chapter 18. But then comes chapter 19. Read with me in the very first verse. The Bible says Ahab told Jezebel everything that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. After they proved the Lord's superiority, all of those false prophets were executed. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, may the gods punish me and do so severely if I don't make your life like the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. In other words, Elijah Your clock is ticking. You have less than 24 hours to live. By this time tomorrow, I am sending out someone, and you you ended their lives. I'm going to end your life. Verse 3 says, Then Elijah became afraid and immediately ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba that belonged to Judah, he left his servant there, but he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. He sat down under a broom tree and prayed that he might die. He said, I've had enough, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. Now, he had just experienced incredible spiritual victory, seeing God at work. Now he's suicidal. He's saying, God, just take my life. Verse 5, then he lay down and slept under the broom tree. Suddenly, an angel touched him. The angel told him, get up and eat. Then he looked, and there at his head was a loaf of bread. Now, the Hebrew word here is angel food cake baked over hot stones and a jug of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord returned for a second time and touched him. He said, get up and eat or the journey will be too much for you. So he got up, ate and drank. Then on the strength from that food, he walked 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mountain of God. He entered a cave there and there he spent the night. Suddenly the word of the Lord came to him and he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I've been very zealous for the, for the Lord God of armies, but the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they are looking for me to take my life. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain in the Lord's presence. At that moment, the Lord passed by. A great and mighty wind was tearing at the mountains and was shattering the cliffs before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a voice, a soft whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle. Now, we're going to come to this in, in, uh, later, but, but he's covering his face because the holiness of the moment was so overwhelming that he recognized God is right here. I, I've got to hide uh, in his presence. And he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. Suddenly, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? I've been very zealous for the Lord God of armies, he replied. But the Israelites have abandoned your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they're looking for me to kill me too. Then the Lord said to him, Go and return by the way that you came to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you are to to anoint Hazael as king over Aram. That's one of your prophet duties. You are to anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, from Abel, Abel, Meholah, as prophet in your place. 
Then Jehu will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will put to death whoever escapes the sword of Jehu. But I will leave 7,000 in Israel, every knee that is not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now, 1 Kings chapter 18, that's a glorious moment for Elijah. 1 Kings chapter 19 is the bottom of the barrel. What I'd like to try to do is to cover two areas. One, what led Elijah to this barren moment when he felt like, God, what, where are you? What are you doing? Because I think that his circumstances have some similarities to ours. And then I'd like to see what God did and how Elijah responded so that he could get out of this kind of barren position that he was in. So first, let's look at what are some of the contributing factors to this point where Elijah said, God, where are you? Well, what are you doing? Why are you not here? What are some things? Well, first, Elijah was afraid. If you look there in verse 3 of chapter 19, after Jezebel made this proclamation, then Elijah became afraid. Of course he did. If, so, if you got word that someone, a, a high political power, had said, look, the CIA, the Secret Service, the Army Rangers, the Navy SEALs, they're all at my disposal, and I am sending someone to kill you. You would be afraid as well. So Elijah heard that, um, heard that uh, proclamation, and he said, I I've got to flee from my life. I've got to run. And during that fearful period, Elijah's perspective on what God might be doing or his, his lack of seeing what God was doing was heightened. Fear often distorts our perspective and keeps us from being able really to see life as it is. It undermines our perspective ability to function well. Now, let's imagine that one of, uh, one of the church's young men decides that there's a girl that he really likes, and he wants to ask her out. He's planning a very first date, and he's thinking, you know what? If I play my cards right, this could be the last first date that she ever has. This, I mean, this could be the beginning of our lifelong romance. And so he really wants to impress her. He's thinking, okay, I live in this amazing city. There are all kinds of sites here. There are canyons and things outside of the city. Where, where would be a really romantic place for our, for our first date? So he says, Freddy's, hamburgers and custard. And so he loads up, and when he goes down there, he's sitting at the table talking, but the whole time he's stammering, and I, <coughs> hi. No, I didn't. It isn't that he doesn't know how to have a conversation or talk. It's the anxiety, the nerves, the fear of the moment that is making the circumstances worse. Perhaps you've been there. Maybe the doctor came in with a chart and he said, I have terrible news. And the fear of that moment caused your perspective on everything that was going to think that God was gone. I mean, I could go, I don't have the time. I've got dozens of other possibilities. But Elijah's fear magnified Jezebel's threat and minimized God's presence in his perspective. Second, Elijah was really tired too. I mean, there was the physical demand of chopping the wood and taking the, the branches and the, the, you know, logs and things like that and building the altar and getting the sacrifice and uh, putting him up on top of the... I mean, there was that physical demand. But also he was drained spiritually. I mean, he was just worn out from the activity. It was a glorious moment, but it really took out a lot out of Elijah. Do you see what happens here? When he, when he flees for his life, when he's, when he's desperate to run, there are two different times where he, where he rested. There in verse 5, the Bible says, Then he lay down and slept under the broom tree, and then in the last sentence of verse 6, so he ate and drank and lay down again. He just needed to rest. He needed to replenish. He, he ate the food that the angel prepared for him, and then he slept. He slept one time, and then he came right back after a little break and slept again. Those of you who are at the 930 service are sleeping through the message again. You took a little break, now another rest. 
That's what happened with Elijah. He, he was spent. And so now he just needed to recharge. Sometimes in our lives, when we are wondering where God is, God, are you doing anything? Our perspective is made worse by the fact that we've we just really stretched ourselves too thin. We're, we're at the limits of what we're capable of doing. And so Elijah was really tired. Third, Elijah was frustrated. You can see it. You can almost hear the edge in his voice down in verse 10. The Lord comes to him and he says, Elijah, tell me what's going on. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of armies. He, he doesn't mention Jezebel here. He doesn't say, you don't know what Jezebel's doing, God. What he's saying is, God, I've been out preaching for you. Can you not do any better by me? God, I mean, I'm out here. I'm out here lifting you up. I thought that you would have done more for me. He's frustrated with God. And, and when, we're in, when we are in those positions, when we're saying, God, I wish you would do something other than you are doing. God, just do something. You're not doing anything. Our frustration begins to create some tension. You know what that's like. You've been in the car driving. You're on the road and you're driving with your family on vacation and you're trying to, you know, I'm, everybody's going to have a good time. I insist on it. And you're driving along and your little grandson or son from the back seat says, Daddy, can I use the... No! We're not stopping for the bathroom. You should have done that last Monday when we left. Now and you do, we're getting there. Or maybe you don't have your family in the car. You're trying to... You know, you're on Interstate 215 and you're trying to get through there and you're in a... You know, the traffic is just at a standstill and you think... It looks like maybe I can get over into this lane, though you know the moment you get into this lane, the lane where you were will start going full force. There'll be 70 miles an hour, but you start edging your way over, and maybe you kind of cut in front of a person who's in this lane already, and when he gets right up next to you and begins to signal to you that he did not like your cutting in front of him, because of your frustration, you do not go, thank you, sir. You're right, I'm being impatient. I, I should act better. When he gets up next to you and starts lecturing you, you don't go, thank you for pointing out my mistake and using such colorful descriptive language. You've really gotten your point across, sir. You're number one, too. You're number one. Too. You don't do that. You, you really lash back because of the frustration. And that's what Elijah was. Elijah was frustrated not only with his circumstances, he was frustrated that God was not doing anything about his circumstances, or at least that's what he thought. Fourth, Elijah felt lonely. You heard it in, in twice. He said, God, I'm the only one left. Everybody else has abandoned you. Nobody else wants to serve you. I don't have any friends who are helping me through this period. Sometimes that can happen with us too. We wonder where God is, but we've isolated ourselves and we, we don't have transparent, honest, vulnerable conversations with people. And as a result of, of our decision to withdraw, we, we don't have anyone in those experiences with us. And since we don't have other people in those experience, experiences with us, we think God's not with us either. So those are some factors that I think led to this point where Elijah said, God, if you're just not going to do anything for me, just go ahead and take me on. But we're not left just, just to shrug our shoulders and say, well, I guess that's just a pretty tough season of life. This passage does give us some clues for when we are in those experiences saying, God, I just don't know where you are. I really need to sense your presence. I have done that before, but I'm not doing that now. God, make yourself real to me. There are some ideas that I think we can see here. First, I've already kind of alluded to this. Sometimes when we're in these positions, we may need to take a conscious step to get some rest. Remember, Elijah twice 
slept. In fact, there's really a third time by the time he goes all the way to Mount Horeb and he spent the night in that cave. And then he replenished himself with the food that the angel prepared. Sometimes the lack of awareness of God's presence is because we have so crowded our lives with so much agenda, so much activity, so much work that we don't leave any space for him to maneuver and move. And so we may need to take a step back and say, God, now, I, right now I'm running a little ragged and I don't sense intimacy with you. I don't sense a closeness with you. And so I'm making a conscious step to say, you know what? Part of my issue here may be that I'm just doing too much. We don't ever find time to rest. We make time to rest. And so Elijah got out of the circumstance. He went to a solitary place. And he said, here's where I'm going to have to recharge. So I think resting is important, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. Second, I think talking with God honestly about what we are feeling is important. You can, I, I told you, you could hear the edge in Elijah's voice. He twice went through the same speech. I've been very zealous for the Lord God of armies. God, what, what are you doing? I'm, I, I don't know why you're not helping me. God, I'm afraid for my life. People are running after me. He did not say to, the, the, uh, to God, well, God, just give me some perseverance. Thou, thou knowest that the queen is after me. He's angry. He's frustrated. And he's saying, God, here's where I am. Now, I want to be very clear about this. Elijah's perspective was distorted. It wasn't right. His perspective that God wasn't doing anything, that God wasn't aware, that God didn't know, that God didn't care, his perspective was off. But that is how he felt. And so rather than pretending he felt otherwise, he said, God, this is how I feel. And you notice that God did not say, oh, how dare you? Boom. God had his conversation with Elijah. Having someone who understands helps. At the beginning of the summer, I was doing a camp with another uh, a group of churches. We were doing a beach camp. Now, I, I, beach camps typically are not my favorite you can't tell it because of the devastating tan that I have right now. <laughs> but I am very fair-skinned. And it doesn't take long for me being in the sun before I can be as red as a fire engine. So I don't get out to the beach very often for that reason. But also, I don't want to be a stumbling block when I take off my shirt. I don't want to create any marital troubles with wives saying to their husbands, now, why can't you look like that? And so I just don't do that often. But we were out there all goofing around and splashing in the waves. And th th this group was here, but a young man was, was down at the end of the beach, and he was trying to get his student minister. I think he wanted to play ultimate Frisbee on the beach, but he was down the beach yelling, hey, hey. But as he yelled, the, the waves were coming in, and they were loud, and the wind was blowing. Hey! And the boy was just taking his voice away. And the student minister was there, what? 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 I know you're talking, but I don't understand what you're saying. God understands. He understands. And so we just need to talk with him about the perspective. God, I don't. I just think that you're not here. I think that, that you don't hear me. Do you care about this? Rather than pretending, oh, Father, I know that thou are going to work out. He knows anyway. So tell him. Third, we need to look for the little ways that God's trying to remind us that he's there. Remember when Elijah was moping and saying, God, just go ahead and take my life. They're going to kill me anyway. I would rather you do it than they do it. God said, step out on the edge of the mountain. And so Elijah got right up on the edge. 
And then all of a sudden, this, this four, if, you're, you know, if you've ever been in the South, hurricane force winds, tornado force winds are coming by, and rocks are peeling off the side of the cliff. But the scriptures add this detail, but God did not show himself in the big wind. And then there was an earthquake that caused the ground underneath Elijah's feet to tremble. I picture him holding onto a tree so that he doesn't tumble down into the canyon. But God did not show himself then. And then this impressive fire display in the sky. No evidence of God. But then, shh, a soft whisper. And the moment was so profound that Elijah pulled his robe over his face because of the awesome holiness of that moment. When we don't sense God's nearness, it may be because we're looking for him to show himself in a big wind or a big earthquake or a big fire when really it's that coincidental call from a friend at just the right moment. Or a passing comment that a co-worker made. What, what did you say? And you said, that's God. Not in the wind, not in the earthquake, not in the fire, but in the little way saying, you think that I don't know. You think I'm not here. I am here. We can't just look for him in the big things. God often reminds, his, reminds us of his nearness with the little things. For example, if we dismiss from this service today and I stand over here in the corner and whisper, the only people who will hear me whisper are those nearest and those to whom I am nearest. Think about that. Elijah heard God in a whisper, which meant he had to be very close. And so we need to look for the little ways that God is speaking to us. Fourth, when we say, God, I just don't know where you are. I don't really see what you're doing. We need to make sure that we get in a group of people who can encourage and support us. God reminded us, and the reason I had to go all the way to the end of the chapter is God, it's, it's almost like God threw this detail in at the end. In verse 18, he says, But I will leave 7,000 in Israel, every knee that is not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. He said, Look, Elijah, you think you're alone. You think you're the only one. You're not even the only prophet left. You, you said that up above, I alone am left. You, they've killed all the other prophets with the sword. Elijah, you are wrong. There are lots of people out there who still love me. There are lots of people who are devoted to me. You need to, you need to make yourself to, uh, available to them. You need to get to where they are. And so when we're in these periods saying, God, I just don't know where you are, find some people who do know where God is and get in with them. Let them support, let them encourage, let them share how God is working in their lives. Let them affirm we see some things that God is doing. When we're fighting that battle all by ourselves, that's when the devil jumps in and says, see, you are a bad Christian. You don't even have any friends to share this with. But when we find those 7,000 that also still really love God, they're able to be the sounding boards. They're able to be the, the landing grounds when we feel like we're tumbling. The last thing that I want to share that I really think is important too is that we need to get back to what we know God wants us to do. In verse 15, I don't want to go through them again, but there are some assignments that God gave to Elijah as a prophet. That's part of what they were to do. They were to anoint. They were to signify, hey, God is going to do something through you. And so after this therapy session, after Elijah had had some time, and remember, this is 18 verses, but, but it doesn't all happen just in a matter of hours. Remember, Elijah traveled 40 days and 40 nights, so there's really this healing period of about six or seven weeks or so where Elijah is recovering, where he's gaining his strength again, where he's saying no to some things, where he said yes before where he's kind of letting his frustrations go. And then God said, okay, now it's time to get back to work. I've heard you. I've comforted you. I've listened to you. Now it's time to get back to work. 
And so you go anoint these people, you go continue in this, in this service. When we wonder where God is, sometimes we sit back and say, well, when I feel like serving again, then that's when I'll do it. But it is in the serving, it is in the laboring, it is in the obeying that we see God is here. God is still moving. He's still working. He's still guiding me. My perspective was off. God's been here the whole time, and it is in doing what we know he wants us to do that we sense the fact that he's right there with us doing it. We, we are not any better than Elijah. We're not any worse than Elijah, but we're not any better. We're going to have some glorious 1 Kings chapter 18 moments where we say, man, God, you have done it again. Thank you. Give me another song to sing. I just want to keep shouting your praise. But it may be that the very next page turn lands us in a 1 Kings chapter 19. And in those periods, God's still present. And by looking at Elijah's example, perhaps we can find some ways to notice that he's there. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, we're so grateful to you that you have given us this chance to be together today. God, you are with us every single step of the way. Not for one single moment have you left us alone. And I pray that even during the dry, dark, lonesome valleys, that you will help us turn our attention to you and recognize your presence with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.